fire of the Holy Ghost to be upon your life this morning. In the name of Jesus, I am believing for somebody to catch on fire. Oh, hallelujah. That's been my prayer. That's been my contention. God, set me on fire for you, oh God. Regardless of my situation and my circumstances, set me on fire. We just gotta give worthy prizes. We can just praise God, get right into the word. Amen. And I'm not throwing no no shade at, at the women. They they looking at me online. They probably talking about me right now. But listen, our speaker today, pastor, preacher, Dr. Buntler, is an incredible father. He's an incredible husband. This, this servant of God has modeled integrity in our community. He is a community builder. He walks into a level of purity that I think that we all should desire to walk in this type of purity of heart. Tonight, I don't want to talk about all his accomplishment. I want to talk about this man's character. The gentlemen that's coming before you have lived a life that's worthy to be duplicated and modeled after. And I'm saying he's perfect. Amen. Neither am I. But I think that our young boys and young men need to see men and men, fathers and husbands that are trying to just get it right. And trying to model this thing that represent Christ. And he's going to come and share. But let's pray. Father, we thank you for an incredible leader. Thank you for Dr. Butler. Thank you for his heart. Thank you for his impartation, his impact in our community. In the ministry. As well as the, wor- 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 the workforce and the secular world. And so we ask that you bless him. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand praise as he comes. Hallelujah. Men in the house, can we give God a hand of praise for men on a Friday night? Not at the club. In the house of God. The word of the Lord says, How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down to the beard, even Aaron's beard, down to the skirts of his garment. It says, as the dew of Hermon descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there, in that unity of brethren, the Lord commands the blessing. And so I believe tonight that the blessing of the Lord is going to be upon each and every one of our life tonight because we've decided to band together in unity and agreement as men. How many of you believe that tonight, that the blessing of the Lord has met us in this place? In the mighty name of Jesus, I want to uh, certainly thank the Lord uh, for Bishop Cooper tonight. Amen. Come on. He's been doing this... uh, men's summit for a while and um, and if we're just honest sometimes it's hard to get brothers together our allegiance and devotions sometimes steer us in so many directions if we're honest this world is really after our attention the media television sports and radio I have nothing against any of those things but everything is vowing for the man's attention and so in order to get a bunch of men in a room. There's got to be a special grace upon your life. You can't make that clarion call and men respond and come out of nowhere unless God has anointed you for this hour. And so once again, Bishop, I just want to honor you for the sacrifice that you made to get us to this place. I've watched your life for years, and, you know, I I grew up uh, really being affectionate towards older people. That's where I spent my time. And one of the things that I learned from older people was if you did something for a long time, it was worthy 
of taking note. And you've been serving God for a long time. And there's nothing to be taken lightly in this microwave, jump off the bandwagon fast, microwave generation. Uh, we don't take it for granted. So I honor you, man of God, and thank God for your life. And I thank God for all of the men of God in here who've been standing on the fist. I see so many of the men of God. I, I'm a person of honor, so I do take the time to honor. I thank God for Pastor Evans. God bless you, man of God. Amen. <laughs> Bishop Pierre, God bless you. Pastor Scott, God bless you. Amen. If I miss any of the men of God, if you're, if you're a pastor, please just raise your hand tonight. I just want to acknowledge you. I see you, man of God. God bless you, man of God. I just thank God for you all tonight. Any, anybody who serves in any level of capacity of leadership, I just thank God for you tonight. But I especially Men, if you can help me, let's just give God a hand of praise for all of our young men that are here tonight. Amen. Some of them we dragged. Some of them didn't have a choice to come, but we got them here nevertheless. But what I learned is even though the natural man may not be paying attention, the spirit man is always receiving. So manhood is all about reference points. What happened at a significant point in your life where you remember that something was done or said that changed your life. And I believe tonight is one of those, those pivot points. Amen? Amen. Listen, um, I'm a person of prayer. I just believe in it. So just for about a minute or two, I just want you to grab a man's hand. I want to open up in prayer. I believe in starting storms, uh, tornadoes. You know, when a cold front meets a warm front, uh, that's when a tornado is created. And so... I just love to hide behind the cross, and I don't ever start till the Holy Ghost shows up in me. So I always start with prayer. And so if you have a, a prayer language, I want you to pray tonight. If you got a natural language, I want you to pray tonight. But one thing is true that we can never get together in the presence of the Lord and not be here. We can never show up and the power of God never be here. The, the way that we know that God has ordained a meeting is that the power of God will show up. There will be signs, wonders, and miracles. There will be transformation and supernatural fellowship. And so it's already happened tonight. So we come up under the banner of Jesus Christ. We woo our God. We walk into his presence tonight, oh God. I think that the, that the bands and the bonds and the chains are already being set free tonight in the name of Jesus I thank God for the anointing that destroys the yoke. I thank you for broken men tonight. No pride, no arrogance, no sin. We all come as children tonight. Before Almighty God, we lay bare and naked and unashamed, God, and saying, if you don't help us, God, there is no help. If you don't change us, God, there is no change. So we thank you tonight, Lord God, that everything that belongs to us, we come for our inheritance, we pursue as men. Men, we come to recover and to take all tonight in the knee in the name of Jesus. We come praying for ourselves and our children's children. We pray for Shreveport and the surrounding regions that men are coming out of dark places because of what is happening tonight. I thank you that the forces of darkness are being pushed back tonight because we come to pray and we come to congregate in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you for ministry gifts that are being unleashed across this city because the the heavens are open over this place tonight in the name of Jesus. I thank you tonight that you are unleashing intercessors in this place. Men that are going to rise up and take their rightful place. Fathers going back to their sons. Sons going back to their fathers. I thank you that this is the pool of Bethesda tonight, oh God. And our, and our territory has been enlarged in this place. In the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody ought to give our God a hand of praise tonight. Glory to God. You can be seated in the presence of God. I promise that I won't be before you long. I'm so honored and privileged to be here. I, I'm super honest with you. I, I don't even know how I end up in places like this because I'm, I'm, I'm really so undeserved. Um, uh, just because, you know, sometimes people are in awe of the grace of God 
and, and I am too, but I, I really am more in, in awe of the mercy of God. It's really God not giving me what I truly deserve uh, because I, I, I know my history and I know my past and I know the things that I've done and just the fact uh, that God can, you know, just, you know, take his hand and, and, and wipe you clean. He can clean you with hyssop and make you white as snow. The fact that God can just, like, change a man's heart regardless of uh, the, the degradation of his sin and the blackness of, of his heart, God can still choose you. And God can still use you. And then God can still call you the apple of his eye. You know, I'm still in awe. I'm infatuated with that part of God. So, so I owe him my life. I owe him my life. And so I'm just grateful to be here tonight. But I do have a word from the Lord. And it has been authenticated and confirmed because I didn't know what Bishop Cooper was going to do tonight with his grandsons. I didn't know about him passing the batons. I didn't even know that there was going to be batons here tonight. But as I was preparing for the word, um, the Lord um, instructed me that I ought to label the message tonight, passing the baton, what is your spiritual inheritance? And so I, I know it's uh, from the veins of the Holy Spirit tonight. And so I, I want to get straight into the word. Um, I'm, a, I'm a teacher by administration, so I'm probably going to point you to death and scripture you to death. I just believe that a, your faith ought to rest in the word of God and not in a man's opinion because everybody's got one, right? But the, the word of God will never pass away. And so um, I, I want to share just five things with you, and I would hope that um, somebody would write these things down, not just a, a, a point of spiritual gymnastics in hopes that when we would write them down and go back and review them, that the Holy Spirit would make a change in our heart. Amen. I want to uh, give you uh, just a little bit of my testimony. I go into the Word of God. Um, this message was really meaningful to me. It's the first time that I've ever preached anything like this. And I must admit to you, I had to do some of my own soul searching. Uh, because as a young man, I grew up homeless most of my childhood. I was suicidal and depressed most of my teenage years. Both of my parents were heroin addicts. Um, so I raised myself on the streets, me and my sister, who was about a year and a half uh, younger than me. And so I ate out of trash cans and out of dumpsters, uh, slept in, a, in abandoned houses. And uh, I was raised in the 80s, so you know we had clotheslines back then. And the way, anybody remember clotheslines? And, and the way that I would dress myself is that I would sneak into your yard and take the clothes off of the clothesline. Um, super uh, uh, criminal history uh, would break into people's houses and steal, steal their items. I bounced from foster home to foster home most of my, my youth. And, and in those foster homes, uh, people would take advantage of me, been uh, through multiple uh, situations of rape and molestation. And if there was a bottom of life, I've been through it. So when I'm standing here telling you about the power of God to be able to raise a person, I'm not talking to you about something I read out of no book. I'm not talking to you about some, somebody done preached to me, no good sermon, no eloquent speech, no uh, articulated words. I'm talking about real, authentic, face-to-face -face encounter with God taking a young kid out of a situation who was nothing and making him into something. I know the power of God, and that same power of God is in the room for somebody tonight because God would never send me anywhere unless there's somebody like me sitting in the room. You may be eight. You may be 80, but somewhere in the room, you're looking for God to change your narrative. You're looking for God to change your life, and you are in a situation where you've been crying out to God, believing what your pastor has been telling you. You want to have faith in what you've been seeing, but you've just been, you just been waiting for the power of God to meet you in this situation. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, that gentleman, I promise you, will happen to many of you tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I want to start with the word of God in Proverbs 13 and 22. And Bishop done preached my message and doesn't know it, but I'm going to do the remaining parts. It says, a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. And the wealth of a sinner is laid up for the just. Look at your neighbor and say, I want to be a good man. I want to be a good man. Amen. The Bible gives us a, a prescription of, of what a good man is. And maybe some of you were like me. Unfortunately, you didn't have that description. 
growing up or what a good man is. When I was growing up, what I saw out of a man was you take your right hand, you slap, slap it across a female's face, and if you slapped it across her face, she was supposed to do everything that you asked. And if you said jump, she was supposed to say how high, right? And then I took that, that, uh, that definition, that prescription of what manhood was into my marriage. I've been married going on 18 years now, but the first three years were hell because nobody ever told me what a good man was. I didn't necessarily have a picture or a capture of what a good man was because on the outside, I saw somebody saying, this is what a man is. But when I got close enough to see their personal life, I didn't really see the good. I was looking for something genuine, some, something authentic. I'm reading about all these good men in the Bible, but God, can you please send some help? The Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And Bishop already told us that a good man thinks generationally. And I tell you, uh, gentlemen, that is the plan of the enemy uh, as we embark uh, in 2024 for you and I to never think generationally. See, what the devil wants to do is to scare you and I, to make us believe, make us think that God is not going to take care of us. So what we can do is just take our hands and just clench around our, our little lives and our, and our cars and our houses and not think about our grandkids, not even thinking about our spiritual children. He wants to put fear into you and I so that we can never pass down what God has given us. But we got to be men of faith. We got to be men who rise up and say, I'm not only concerned about me, but I'm concerned about those that are coming behind me. And so I wanted to talk about inheritance, inheritance. Then I'm going to give five types of inheritances and I'm going to take my seat because uh, what I feel like the Lord is doing is he's using me to uh, give a foundation for what's going to happen on Saturday at, when we have the conversation. So write this down just as a definition of inheritance. What is an inheritance? And from God's perspective, not Jet Ebony or the Inquisitor, not Webster's Dictionary, but from what, how God sees an inheritance. It is to receive by succession or will as an heir. To receive by succession or will as an heir. It is the acquisition of a possession from past generations, especially from parents or offspring. It's an acquisition of a possession. If I didn't hand anything off, it wasn't an inheritance. From past generations, especially from parents or offspring. So when I say the word inheritance, that's the working definition that I'm using. It is a succession. It is the idea that my time is limited here on earth. And life here on earth is not about duration. It's not about how long you're here. It's about donation. It's about what you give while you're here. Jesus was only here 33 years and he fulfilled his assignment. Nobody's promised to tomorrow, tomorrow. So my mind is all about what I can pass on today. An inheritance. What's the first thing that a man should pass to his offspring? his natural children, his spiritual children. And automatically, when we say that, the first thing a, a man's mind drifts to is his physical possessions. But I want to tell you biblically, that's not the first thing that a man should pass. Pastor, what's the first thing a man should pass to his offspring? Please write this down. He should pass on his convictions. His convictions. Pastor, what is, his, what is a conviction? It is a summation of your philosophy and your beliefs. A summation of your philosophy and your beliefs. The deepest conviction that a man can ever pass to his son, the deepest conviction that a man can ever pass to his son is the, is the, is the idea that a man needs God. Not that God is supplemental. Not that he's a good addition. And we have colloquialisms in church, and, and they're good. And, and we say things like, God is the head of my life, and it's true. God is the center of my life, and that's also true. But can we go a little bit deeper? If we're honest, God is my life. Yes, that means I'm dead without God. I can buy my son tennis shoes and maybe get him a car at the age of 16. And I, and I can put them in sports. And all of those things are good. But if I haven't driven home the conviction that, son, you need God. Without God, you die. I haven't started his life. 
must give him my conviction. And so my, my kids must see me pray. I leave my door open at my home and purpose on purpose. I got a prayer room. It's, it's, it's open on purpose. Uh, instrumental music blasting loud every single day because I want my boys to see me on my knees. So every time we have a situation, they say, Daddy, how did it happen? So I can give credit and credence to God because one day he's going to pick up that, that habit and that behavior and say, I remember my dad said the reason that we have a house, the reason that we have cars, the reason that we're blessed is because God has created this opportunity. I gotta pass down my convictions. As a matter of fact, the word of God says that we call fathers. If I was to look up the word father in the Hebrew, it would be the word fundus. Fundus is where we get our English word foundation. Listen, let me tell you something so significant about that word. Gentlemen, see you, man, you are the foundation for this earth, the foundation for this family. I know people have said you're the head of your family, but come on, let's get a little bit deeper. Really, from God's perspective, you're not just the head. If we were to look at a house, God calls me and you the foundation. As a matter of fact, if the sheriff was to come in here right now and we were to tear up all the walls, and we would tear off the ceiling and we would knock the lights down and the foundation was still intact they wouldn't condemn this building they let us still have church but the moment that they would come in here you can have chandeliers you can have lights paint on the wall but there was a crack in the foundation they would, they would, they would put uh, yellow tape around it and say y'all got to get that fixed before you can have service again the same thing is true of you man of God that until you come underneath your wife underneath your children underneath your city underneath your congregation you the foundation when God says he's Abba he's phoned He's the foundation of everything. The book of Hebrews says that God is upholding all things by the word of his power. So should we in our families. That's the conviction I pass down. Son, you the foundation. That's why you can't hook. You can't crook. You can't play around. You can't be immature. You got to make sound decisions because everything is depending on you. God not looking at her. He's looking at you first. He's not looking at the community leader. He's looking at you first. You're the man in the room. Come on, son. You're on the basketball team. I know you're 13, but you're the foundation. You're the reason this team works. I don't care if you work at the hospital. I don't care if you work at the schoolhouse. If a man is in the place, he's the foundation. From God's perspective. Yeah. Somebody say foundation. So I had to pass down my convictions. And I had to teach. I had to teach. I had to teach the men around me. And I'm adamant about this in my ministry. You got to understand the hole in your soul, man. You need God. Can I tell you what happens when you don't get God? Every man, every man, every boy in here right now. Eight years old, five years old, God created a unique hole in his soul that only God can fulfill. And listen, did, did you know that God created you? He created you to want to be high, but a supernatural high. So if you don't know, if you don't know that, and then you have this hole in your soul. You already have an appetite for the supernatural. A man always wants to be above his situation. It's a reason you don't like being told what to do. Because situations and circumstances were never supposed to be over you. God gave you dominion. He told you to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That's your spiritual DNA. That's your inheritance. That's your manhood talking. If you, if you don't know that, then you'll succumb to all of the cheap veneers that we have out here. So I see why Paul says be not drunk with wine wherein is excess but be filled with the Holy Spirit man you can get your alcohol addiction and your cocaine addiction and your heroin addiction confused with your need for the Holy Spirit because there's something that you always wanted to be high but it's not from drugs and alcohol it's the Holy Ghost but if I don't teach my son that he don't know that so the friend offers him marijuana he goes for cocaine and heroin. He says, something in me just wants to see how it feels to have an out-of-body experience. Really, when that place was designated for the Holy Ghost. Man, you have a place, a hole in your soul to be affectionate towards God. God put it there. It doesn't make you feminine. It doesn't make you soft. Every man in here has a place where he's supposed to commune. He's supposed to coin you with God. Every man. And so if you don't know that man of God, what you'll do is you'll go chase the next best thing. Because the next best thing that God created after a man is a woman. And you'll find yourself in the bed, out of the bed. Chasing women can never be satisfied. And not understanding that every time I sleep with a woman, every time I spend time with her, and, and it seems like there's still a hunger, there's still a thirst, and I can never feel it. I just keep getting more and more women, more and more sexual encounters. And why is this agitation still there? And why is this issue? Why am I still hungry? Why can't it? Why 
does it feel like I can't feel this void? I'm telling you because you need intimate fellowship with God. And you got to teach your family that. Son, your hunger is for God first. And if you don't feel that hole with God, you will chase everything else but God. You will be chasing skirts and fantasies. You will be chasing pornography and addiction. Heroin and marijuana will be right around the corner. If you don't learn that that hole must be fulfilled by God, and it's not a message of condemnation, but we got to bring spiritual intelligence to the church because we can sing, we can pray, we can dance and say hallelujah, but I know that you go home and sit on the corner of your bed at night and try to fight that demon and wonder what to do with this addiction. Listen, I count so pastors, I know some of them that preach on Sunday morning, mighty men of God, and then they call me on Monday evening and they say, Pastor, tell me something to keep me from turning this computer on because I want to go look at a naked woman because my father taught me at the age of eight and this demon has grown up with me. I'm sorry, I'm just real. I pass on my convictions. The book of Genesis 18 and 19, this is the man of God. Uh, it says, for I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon him Abraham that which he's spoken of. This is God talking about Abraham. He said, I ain't going to hide nothing from Abraham. The reason I won't hide it from Abraham, because I know he's going to go in his kid's room at night, and he's going to tell them what I've said. He's going to teach them my ways. So there's nothing that I will withhold from a man who will go into his kid's room and say, that's, I know that's how you did it, son, but this is what the word of God says. A real man follows after the word of God. God said, I can't hide nothing from that man. Amen. Number one, somebody say convictions. I'm almost done. Number two, what else do I pass on before my house, before my cars? Number two, I pass on a good name. Mm hmm Proverbs 22 and 1, it says a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. When I was in my 20s, I didn't believe that scripture. I said, no, God, give me the money. Until I started having kids and started getting more responsibility, and I realized that the favor of God is invaluable. There are certain things money can't buy. I looked up the word name. It means Shem. It means a reputation which stands as a memorial or a monument. When I die and I leave my kids, and I'm always talking to my oldest son about what you got to do when daddy die. Will I be remembered as Antoine the hustler? The manipulator? The deceiver. What would they say at my funeral? Was he, was, was he a man of righteousness? Will, will, will my son be in, be in need and, and because my name is good, he'll be able to walk into somebody's office and somebody say, I remember your father. He stood for righteousness. Son, all I need to know is your last name is Butler. Come, come on in and let me help you. What name are we leaving in our city? Your name is everything. And, and maybe you are like me. Maybe your father didn't leave you with a good name. But this is your opportunity to change it. This is your opportunity to make your last name mean something. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because when I was growing up, they said you was going to be just like your daddy. And you, that means that you was going to be a pimp, a hustler, a liar, a, 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 a womanizer, a manipulator. My grandfather was the same way. But, but God had, had mercy on me, and, and I remember God asking me, he, he said, do you want to have a good name to pass down to your children? I said, yes, God, because I've never seen it before. And, and, and God began to, uh, uh, to, began to deal with me. And can, can, can I just be honest with y'all tonight? And Because most of the behaviors I had, I learned, and he said, Antoine, you're a liar. And, and you masqueraded as white lies, have truths, exaggerations. You can never have a good name that say. He, he said, Antoine, I need to deal with your mind because you have a way with words. And so your, your words are cunning and deceitful. You, you learned that on the corner while you were selling crack cocaine because that's how you sold your crack cocaine. And he said, Antoine, you have to change that. He said, Antoine, you are, you are a womanizer. You look down at women. And so you have to, you have to change that. Uh, 
the, the, the way that you see your relationships that if anybody doesn't benefit you, you become a people abuser. You're not a motivator. You are, you are an abuser. And because I've given you persuasion and influence, you use it to get what you want. And the end justifies the mean for you. You don't have any character. You don't have any integrity. You can't walk. I can never give you a good name. But if you're willing to change it, and I say, Lord, I'm broken before you. All you said is true. Every man in this room, you have you you have you have you have a a, a, a time where God comes visit you to visit you, and He says, "Do you really want to be clean? Do you really want to be holy? Do you really want to do it right this time?" He keeps visiting the children of men. The Bible says, and I love that He comes in the privacy of my own home. He comes because He don't want to embarrass me. He don't want to shame me. He comes in His small, still voice and asks me, "Antoine, are you really? Is your heart ready to change so that I can give you a good name?" He's coming to every man in this room. He's already come to you. I don't care if you're 12 years old. I know he's coming. My name has to be good because my daily decisions are either adding pain or privilege to my children when I die. My name is going to add privilege or pain. There's certain, there's, there's, there's children right now they can't get an opportunity. They, 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 they can't get favor. They can't go through certain doors because they found out who their daddy was. I work with them. I had a family right now. The last name, whenever you say this last name, it means trouble. Your daddy left them with that. Somebody say, not me. Come on, say it like you mean it. Not me. Hey, man, not me. Number three, I'm getting out of here. I ain't even got the physical stuff yet because from God's perspective, you get this together, the physical stuff come. Number three, I leave my, my, my inheritance through relationships and connections. In the word of God in John 19, 26 and 27, Jesus at the cross getting ready to go with his father. He's giving some type of administration on what's going to happen to the disciples. He's looking at the disciple which he loved. He's looking at his mother which he loves. The Bible says when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing by, he said unto his mother, woman, this is your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Even Jesus, even Jesus had the wisdom to pass on his relationships after his death. What relationships will we pass on to our children? We got to think about it, men of God. Are, are, are we developing relationships? So listen, uh, the, the Holy Spirit told me there's three types of relationships, three types of relationships that we got to leave our kids. Number one is connectors. Number one is connectors. These aren't people necessarily that can help you, but they know somebody who can help you. Y'all, y'all remember the, uh, y'all remember Naaman who, who had leprosy and, and, and the, the, uh, the, the prophet said, go wa- wash in the Jordan River. He's like, I ain't washing in that nasty river. And the slave girl say, you know, you need to do what the man of God said. The slave girl connected Naaman to the prophet. There's got to be somebody in your life that can, that can connect you to what you need. Listen, you can't be prideful. You can't be arrogant. Listen, young men, you got to have manners. You got to say thank you. You got to say please. You got to say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. It's the, it's the difference. It's the difference between you getting the job and not getting the job. Yes, sir. I like him. Yeah. Take you with me. I need connectors. They can't necessarily help me, but they're, they're, they know the people that can help me. I need to leave those relationships behind for my sons, my daughters. Number two, credible people, credible men of influence. These are people who can use their leverage to rewrite your narrative. Bishop Cooper didn't have to give me this stage. He could have chose anybody, but he gave me this stage. He used his leverage to help me. Number three, you need to leave your children with consolers. Men of God, listen to me. I'm a mental health therapist by my secular trade. Listen, you got to have a shoulder to cry on. All of that, um, um, you just pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You can handle it all by yourself. If you tell somebody else what's going on with you, you less than a man, you weak. Listen, that is from the pits of hell. 
I, I haven't seen that in the scriptures anywhere. The Bible says that we are interdependent. Somebody's the eye, somebody's the hand, somebody's the foot. Listen, man, I need you and you need me. Holding that stuff in will kill you. Men are going to their grave with depression and stress and nobody knows that you're going through and somebody told you that you are not a man if you can't handle it all by yourself and you have no man to pour out to. Nah, that's, that's, that's not biblical. The Bible says in Proverbs 11 and 23, there's safety in a multitude of counselors. You need a couple men you can talk to. Consolers. Number four. I got to leave my children some physical assets. Some money, some property, some physical assets. That means I can't spend it all. That means I'm going to have to have delayed gratification. There's so many things that I want to buy, I want to do, because listen, you got to be careful. Like, if you like me, I, I came from the hood. So I like everything. I like 24 inch rims. I like leather seats. I like gold chains. I was getting all that stuff in my 20s. And my, my two and my three or my four year old sons had zero in their savings accounts. That's not what a man does. So, so every week there may be something that I want, but I got to take care of them first. I got to take money and shift it into their account because I don't know if I'm going to leave here tomorrow. I got to leave them something. Yeah. And I'm, not, and I'm not advocating for any company around here, but I'll be honest with you. Brothers, listen. You might want to put some life insurance on your life. I'm not advocating any company. Right? It's, it's the quickest way to build an estate. I would hate to leave my wife and kids with nothing but what's in my investment account unless you just balling like that. And then they, now my wife has to go work two jobs. My, some, now some man has to come help my family because I didn't handle my business. No. Mm -mm. It's the same price that you're paying for those clothes every week. Every time we go to McDonald's and Burger King and hanging out with the boys, it's the same price to buy you some life insurance. Yeah. Somebody say, handle our business. Handle our business. Listen, I got to do that because some of our kids not starting at zero. They starting at minus zero. Listen, it took me, I'm 43. It took me 20 years to get myself together. I, wasn't, I was 33 by the time I learned to deal with my own rape and molestation. 33, married, 33. By the time I actually started getting things right, I was 40. I'm behind the eight ball. Ground zero, underground zero. Can't afford to play with my children's future. So, yeah. Number five, and I'm out of here. Number five, what am I leaving behind? This is the most important one to me. I'm leaving behind a mantle. This scripture keeps me going, Bishop, right here. When I'm sleepy, when I'm tired, God gives me a routine. You got to get up and do this every day, every day. God, I'm tired. God, I'm sleepy. I got a lot to do. You get up and you do it. 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 You got three boys that's counting on you. You got a wife that's counting on you. You can't afford to be lazy. You can't afford to procrastinate. Get up and do it. This scripture holds me. And if y'all hear nothing else, I want you to hear this scripture, Acts 13 and 36. Please write it down. This compelled me to handle my business. It says, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep, was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. Let me say that again. David, after he had served his own generation, you and I are responsible for serving our own generation. What legacy are we going to leave behind in this generation? You don't get to do this again. I want to leave my mantle behind because what's on my head controls my life. What is it in my hand that I can leave my sons? What is it in my hand that I can leave my daughters? I must leave a mantle. Uh, so, and, and, and listen, and I, and I love my kids, but listen, I, I know there are some, some young people in my life that's not my biological kids. They're my right. spiritual children. Right. And I know the mantle's going to fall on them too. Good. Right. Amen. Amen. So as, as we're, as, and I'm closing as we, as we are, as we are uh, finalizing this conference, as we're going into um, tomorrow and we're getting ready for um, the panelists, 
I want us to be thinking about these five things. Listen, the Spirit of God is going to visit you, visit some of you tonight and begin to ask you to start being strategic. Start being strategic. I want us to be sensitive to the Spirit of God and begin to just write. Now, listen, we got to write the vision and we got to make it plain. It's, listen, it's not too late. Maybe you don't have anything saved. You don't have anything in your bank account. You haven't started anything for your kids. Listen, it's not too late. Jesus can take five loaves and two fish and begin to multiply. He just needs for us to get started. He'll help us along the way. But we got to man up. We got to handle our responsibility. We got to be ready to pass that baton. I want to be like Jacob. The Bible says that he gathered his feet together and began to bless all of his sons. And then God took his spirit. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Well done. Well done. Look at your neighbor and say, well done. That's what we want to hear. Well done. Well done. Come on. Can you stand to your feet for me? Listen, I want to do this, and then I'm going to hand it over to Bishop. And I know this is not everyone. It's not everyone. But there are some of you tonight. And the only reason I'm doing, and the only reason I'm doing this is just because the Lord commands me to do this every time, every time I go minister. There are some of you tonight. You, you're listening to me. And you've been hurt as a child never got it dealt with it's affecting your manhood you're wrestling with the dreams you're wrestling with the visions you're wrestling with the behaviors and you're sick and tired of being sick and tired I'm only saying this because the only, re only way I got help was the mercy of God landed upon my head I don't give no credit to no man the mercy of God met me. That mercy is for here, is here for somebody tonight. Maybe you, you don't have to say, I don't want to put a microphone in your face. You don't even have to say what your situation is. I'm just open and honest. So I tell y'all stuff like my molestation, drug addiction, and all that stuff, just because I don't got no reputation and don't need one. Because I want to help you. But maybe that's your situation. I just need some men praying with me tonight. Maybe that's your situation. Listen, I just want you to come. And the only reason I want you to come is just because I want to pray and lay hands on you because I, I know that God gives me the grace for this. That's the only reason I want you to come. But you got to be unashamed and you got to be broken. You got to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. I just want to come pray for you, man of God. I don't want to know your situation. I just know that the power of God is going to meet you. If that's you, you say, Pastor, something has happened in my childhood. I never talked to anybody about it, but I know it's affecting me. I just want you to come. I just got two appeals, and I'm going to hand it over to Bishop. If you're a young man in here and something's happened, you don't have to tell me what happened. I just need you to come. I don't want to know your business. I don't want to know your story. Some of y'all in here, you may be 70, you may be 80 years old. It happened when you were eight. But listen, the only reason the only reason you haven't been able to move forward is just this hurdle you got to get over. And, and if you're honest, you can't even hug and embrace your son. You want to. You want to hug him so bad. You want, to, you, want to, you want to be affectionate so bad. But there's a block there. I already know what it is. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. But I know a God. I know a God. I know a God. My second appeal, I don't ever come. I don't ever come unless there's some man struggling with mental health. You here tonight. Dealing with depression. Dealing with uh, stress schizophrenia, bipolar, I don't care what name they give it. None of it is above the name of Jesus. You come. I don't want to know your situation. I don't want to know your problem. You're not coming to me. You're coming to the author and the finisher of your faith. There's a man in here right now struggling with his marriage. You say, Pastor, I'm struggling with the marriage. It's not her fault. It's mine. It's my behavior. You come. We're coming to meet the power of God. Not no man. Please don't look at me. Christ is here to meet you. Come on, y'all help me in the congregation pray. There's two of you still left. I just want to be obedient to the Lord. There's a man right now, I hear the spirit of grace say, you, you, you and your father are at odds. 
God wants to rectify that situation, you come. He don't want you to die and you and your father be in that situation. You come, man of God. You don't got to like what he does, but you do have to honor him. If you want your days to be long, if you want your son to look you in the face and say, Daddy, I love you, you got to do your father right. I don't care what he did in the past. That's you, you come. Hallelujah. Would there be someone else? Would there be someone else? Hallelujah. There's one more man in here. Come on, if, if you feel a nurse to come, if you feel a nurse to come and you feel something holding you back, that's not God. I promise you that's the devil. He don't want you to have your Kairos moment. You come. Y'all mind if I just talk really here tonight and not fake a shake? Rape and molestation, physical abuse, your dad beat the crap out of you. He beat your mom. You find yourself beating your woman. You come. The power of God's gonna break tonight. Drug addiction, you still find yourself flirting with it. Pornography, all that. God's a man's man. He wants you free. You come. You come. You come, man of God. I don't care how old you are. 17, 18, 25. I pray in Christ that we catch you early. So some of you young men don't have to go through what we have. We went through as older men. You come. that song, man of God. Only you can satisfy my heart. Only you can satisfy my soul. Only you can satisfy my heart. Man, just lift your hands. Mr. Cooper, can you help me, man of God? Shaka barandi rio ko sandi rio ko sai reka barororororororam sandi rio ko shai. Listen, you don't have to feel nothing. You just gotta believe Jesus. If you're at this altar, the only thing that I need you to do, I just need you to see Jesus high and lifted up. Close your eyes. Don't look at no human being. Humans will kill your faith. You just gotta look at God high and lifted up. However you see God, that's all I need you to do. And if you out at this altar, I just need you to begin to call on the name of Jesus. Something's going to break for a man tonight. Oh, shaka bandi di oko, sandi di oko sai. Re ka ba 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 na ro 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 bo, sandi di oko, sandi di oko sai. Hallelujah. Thank you. In the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Christ, thank you for meeting him tonight. In the name of Jesus, life change forever. Healing. 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 Healing in the name of Jesus. Come on, pastors. Can y'all come help me at the altar tonight? Come on, if you're a pastor, come help me tonight. Glory to God. If you're not in line, I think God, I think God is rearranging. He's rewriting your narrative in the name of Jesus. Come on, if you're in the back, just continue to pray. Glory to God. I thank God for this man of God, for rewriting the narrative of his life. Jesus has met him tonight in his place of desperation, oh God. Changing the scene, oh God. Raising him up for such a time as this. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Come on, pray, men. That's what we do. The Bible said men ought to always pray. Some of y'all need to cry out to the Lord tonight and say, Lord, forgive me, Jesus. Lord, forgive me. Give me a new heart and a new start. A new heart and a new start. A new heart and a new start. I'm broken, God. I put away the pride. I put away the arrogance. I need God. My children are depending on me. Thank you, Lord God, for pouring in the oil and the wine. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. 
I rewrite your destiny, young man, in the name of Jesus. I decree and declare that you are a David, a man after God's own heart, in the name of Jesus, that God is raising you up in this generation to be an end-time leader, in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, bless you, young man. I rewrite your narrative in the name of Jesus. I decree and declare that you are a Joseph, highly favored by God in the name of Jesus, that the doors of heaven are open for you and your life. I decree and declare that your, your family will be blessed, that your posterity will be blessed, that wherever your feet shall tread, oh, the Holy Ghost will be with you in the name of Jesus. I silence all the voices of the event I decree and declare that every man in this house is being set free by the blood of Jesus and the word of his testimony. Rape and molestation that has caused you to lose your sensitivity. I decree and declare tonight that your emotions are being regulated by the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. I decree and declare that the spirit of forgiveness is breaking out. You forgive your perpetrator in the name of Jesus so that you can move on with your manhood in the name of Jesus. I decree and declare that you are receiving your inheritance. Glory to God that whatever you put your hands to will turn to, to, turn to gold. I decree and declare, man of God, that you are the apple of God's eye. I decree and declare that your ministry will overflow in the name of Jesus, that your children, hallelujah, will say that my father was a blessed man in the mighty name of Jesus, that men tonight are putting down pride, putting down arrogance, putting down pride, putting down arrogance in the name of Jesus man of God that you will be fruitful that you would multiply that you would replenish the earth in the name of Jesus there are some pastors here tonight you need to lay hands on your members on your men and say we're going to grow this ministry we're going to go with God in the name of Jesus we're going to rise up to our rightful place our ministry is going to grow because we free our ministry is going to grow because we free this is not hype this is the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ this is not hype this is the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Bible says whom the son sets free is free indeed some of y'all men looking at me you've never been free before you've been coping you've never been free you've been under strongholds you've never been free you've been under soul ties but by the power of Jesus Christ tonight we break every stronghold we break every soul tie in the name of Jesus old girlfriends old relationships that's keeping you from loving your wife we break those strongholds tonight in the name of Jesus some of you have been manipulated into bad situations bad relationships had things put in your drink had things put in your food voodoo and witchcraft and hexes have been cast on you to keep you in a relationship but by the power of Jesus Christ tonight we break it we sever it at the root tonight by the power and the blood of the Lamb tonight in the name of Jesus who the Son sets free is free indeed man live in freedom live in freedom tonight man live in freedom tonight in the name of Jesus hallelujah glory to God hallelujah only you can satisfy my so only you can satisfy my heart. Yes, sir. We come to get free, man. We didn't come to play. This man of God right here, can you bring him to me? Share that you. Raka you. Come on, lift your hands. That's a Joshua anointing on your life. I thank you for the ability. There's a, there's a grace in your life for men. In the name of Jesus, your job is to get men. 
Your job is to get men across the Jordan River. So God has placed a grace on your life to tell men, as for you and the gods that you served on the other side of the river, y'all can have that, but as for us and our house, we're going to serve the Lord. So I hear the spirit of grace saying that he's given you an anointing to help men cross over, cross out of addictions, cross out of, cross out of homosexuality, to cross out of, out of adultery. God has put the grace on your life. I hear the Lord say they've called you the black sheep, less than, left behind. But God has raised you up for such a time as this. There's a reason that you came to this men's conference. God needed me to connect with your belly tonight. He needed me to tell you out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water in the name of Jesus. I hear the Lord say, leave your sins behind and he'll make you white as snow. He'll give you a name among the heathen tonight in the name of Jesus. There is a grace to set free. It's the breaker anointing. It's the breaker anointing. It's the breaker anointing. It's the breaker anointing in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, 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 Jesus. Hola Makande. Shaka Sata. Thank you, Jesus. Hey. Hey. I'm sorry, men. I'm going over. I'm just being obedient to the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry, men. But the God, but the Lord is doing a work tonight. I hate bondage. I hate it. I hate bondage. I hate it. I hate faking church. I hate playing church. I hate faking wholeness. I hate faking healing. I hate faking what can be real. Either God is real or he isn't. Either he's real or he isn't. Either he's powerful or he's not. Or he's not. Either he's the man or he's not. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man of God in the back, can I come pray for you? Can you can I pray for you? All of you right there. Yes, sir. You were come here. She had a bandido. Come here, I want to pray for you. Hallelujah. Y'all just give me a second. I'm sensitive to the Holy Ghost and I love men. Hallelujah. So sometimes God puts a grace on a person's life to transition. Everybody can't transition. Everybody can't transition. Some people like to camp around mediocrity. But God would touch some people's heart and give them the ability to transition. That's on you. So all I want to do, I just want to pray over you that the grace of God will help you to transition because you're an out-of-the-box thinker. And so God needs that. You're an out-of-the-box thinker. God needs that. God needs that. So you're going to help transition some of the old foginess break up the religion and the monotony and there's going to be kids who are not your kids that's going to follow you because they love the out of the box thinking. I just want to partner with the grace that's on your life. Can you lift your hands? I thank you Jesus for the grace to transition. Thank you that you love this man of God. Oh glory he just getting started God. I thank you for the uniqueness the individuality to change the circumstances and situations of young men. I partner with this grace. Add my faith to his faith in the name of Jesus and say, God, he do signs, wonders, and miracles. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God. Listen, listen, listen. I just want to do this before we end, before I pass this over to Bishop. Every man in this room got to have a man to connect to. Don't be foolish and think that you're going to get on an island and win. You don't win as a man by yourself. Listen, Jesus, Jesus didn't do it by himself. He met John. Say, baptize me. John say, no, you baptize me. He said, man, to fulfill all righteousness, I got to go through you. Even Jesus had to partner. You got to partner. You got to partner. So one more time, the, 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 the man that we're going to give a round of applause for is the man that we all need, Jesus Christ. Come on, can we give Jesus a hand of praise? Come on, the best hand of praise. Can we give him a hallelujah? Come on, celebrate Jesus.
Awesome. Come on, clap your hands one more time. What a sound word. Perfect, perfect, perfect. We praise God. Peyton, I didn't, I didn't say nothing. That was a word of the Lord to you, man. That was just a, a word of the Lord. Praise God. You may have your seats for just one minute. Um, I want to say to Pastor Butler, man, you just, the Holy Spirit just like nailed that thing. Let's give the Lord one more hand praise for just sound word. Uh, the gentleman that, uh, that he last prayed for right there, I also saw, and I told you this, that, that colors, like a lot of colors around you, uh, and it's, it's a sign and an affirmation of creativity. And there's an innovation inside of you. You think differently. Because you're supposed to set new orders. You're innovator. Innovators are rare. And it's always hard for them to fit in. Okay? David was rare. He was the eighth child. Sign of new beginnings. But his brothers didn't understand him. They took him out of context. Okay? And so what I'm saying to you is you're not crazy. You are marked to create. You're marked to be in charge. You're marked. And I'm not saying leave your jobs or nothing like that. I'm just saying understand who you are, that God has put his hand on you, and you are unique. Create. Innovate. Dream. Build. Okay? I just, it's almost like I can see your mind turning. Like, like ideas just come out of nowhere. Okay? And I want, I want you to be encouraged by that. Don't be discouraged. Be encouraged because it is a gift of God. And so, Lord, we declare right now your blessing. Upon, just, just stretch your hand up, son. Just, yeah. In the name of Jesus. All this stuff that I'm talking about, see, God's going to bring you into a new place. If you just get in prayer, man, and a lot of things you don't understand right now.